Good morning, church. Let me invite our kids to head toward children's worship. And while they're doing that, go ahead and pull out your Bibles with me. And we're going to find ourselves in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So we continue on in our series. Um, for those of you that may not have been here, maybe you're here for the first time. We are uh, in a series that we started a few weeks ago where we are stepping through 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians. We'll be doing that uh, week by week and uh, verse by verse. And so this is week number five. And we've called the series, How Can I Be Sure? And I told you when we started that we are hitting on some very deep uh, questions uh, that we find in the Scripture, that we're doing a lot of things here, that my hope, uh, my hope in all of this is that we look back a few months from now and realize that God, for those of us that have really plugged into this, that God has taken us to a deeper place. And I believe in my heart that's really going to happen this morning. Um, we are going to hit a very hard subject. It's one of those, honestly, probably, if you didn't know we were going to talk about it today, you're sitting here and it's affecting marriages uh, throughout the congregation. It's affecting people. And we're just going to hit it head on. We don't hide behind anything here. We're going to get in God's Word and we're going to talk about sexual integrity this morning. That's where Paul takes us. So we're not going to skip that part. We're going to look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. And I will just say this. This is one of those messages I didn't intend for it to be heavy, but it's going to be heavy today. So we're going to tear it down, and we're going to build it back up. We're going to see what God has to say to us. This is one that punches the church in the gut. This is one of those that hits us in the heart, just to be real honest with you. And I want to talk about the background for just a second. Let's see why Paul brought us to this place in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Over the last few weeks, we've talked about uh, why Paul wrote this letter to the church at Thessalonica. He loved them. He had planted the church there. He and Silas had gone there, and they planted this church. And if you remember, they were quickly run out of town. They were only there for about three weeks. And the Scripture says that the persecution was so bad uh, that they were run out of town. And that happened often as these churches were planted in the New Testament. So Paul's very concerned about them. He writes to them. He wants to remind them. He, he's worried about how they're doing spiritually. He wants to remind them that the gospel that he had brought to them, the gospel he presented to them, was a gospel that was filled with integrity that this wasn't some you know, fly-by-night thing, that Paul brought them the, the real answer to life. He was reminding them that uh, because of the culture of that day, that the gospel that he brought to them was full of purity, that, that it had no immorality about it, idolatry in that day. The idol worship was mixed with sexual immorality. He said, this is a pure gospel. He said, my motives were pure in bringing it to you. He didn't do it for money or for fame or fortune. He wasn't a burden on them when he brought it to them. He said, this is the answer to life, and we brought it to you. And I want to make sure you're sticking with it. So Paul writes this letter. He's so concerned about them that eventually he sends Timothy to go and check on them. Timothy goes and checks on the church at Thessalonica, and he comes back with a good report to Paul. He says they are doing well. They're sticking with the faith despite persecution. And so Paul's encouraged. We talked about that last week. And so Paul's encouraged by what he hears. And isn't it always encouraging when you hear good things about the church, when the church is doing what the church is supposed to be doing? And that's what Paul heard. But, there's always a but, right? But Paul knows that despite the temptations they are fa that because of the temptations they're face facing, and here it is with us, we can be doing well spiritually, but temptation's always out there. And we have the ability to sin. We're just that far from a fall. And you see, Paul knew that, and so he's concerned about it. You read at the end of chapter 3, leading up to where we're going to be today in verse 12, and he said, May the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you. And here's what he said in verse 13. He said, So that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. And so Paul was concerned that they were growing in holiness because he knew that temptation would come. He knew that they needed to continue to grow in their faith. And here's what I believe Paul knew, because here's where he goes in chapter 4 as he begins to talk about the particulars. He knew that sexual immorality was the very first thing he needed to talk to them about. 
There is just something about sexual sin that's different. I understand. I know sin is sin is sin. You'll go to hell just as much for telling a lie as you will for having an affair. I understand that without repentance and without forgiveness from God. But there's something about sexual immorality where the consequences are just different, where it affects things in a different way. And we'll talk about that. And, and Paul knew that sexual immorality, if it's not checked up on, if it's not changed, if there's not a, if there's not a change in the pattern in that, that it could be disastrous. And he knew that for the church at Thessalonica. I mean, think about sexual immorality. Sexual immorality entered into the world with the fall of Adam and Eve. Think about creation. Adam and Eve created in perfection. The Bible says they were naked and unashamed. They were naked and didn't even know it. Wouldn't that be awesome? They had no idea. But the tempter came and they enter into sin. And all of a sudden, their sexual immorality, it says they realized their nakedness and had to cover themselves. The Bible tells us, I, I spoke about this Wednesday night to one of our small groups here on Wednesday night, and, and could you imagine being Adam and Eve? You're created in perfection. You're living in a life of perfection. The Bible says that they were created from the dust. And we, can, we can't imagine that life of perfection. We live in a fallen world. We have a sinful human nature, and we, and we, we, we live, we've never known anything but sin, Right? And so for us to think like Adam and Eve got to think at one time is a little bit different. But could you imagine them at one point in time knowing they came from dust, but they're created, in, they're in a, in a world of perfection. Nothing goes wrong. No, no, sin, no, no sin there, no, no sickness, no death. And then all of a sudden, you hear God pronounce judgment upon sin, and He says, from the dust you were created, and to the dust you will return. And now you realize that there's death because of sin. The wages of sin is death. It had entered in. And there, sexual immorality. Think about King David. The Bible says that King David was a man, what? Crea created after God's own what? A man created after God's own heart. But if you know anything about David, David's big downfall was sexual immorality, his sin with Bathsheba. And the Bible says that it affected him so much that he tried to cover it up. It, it led to more sin. Sexual immorality leads to other things. David murdered he, he murdered Bathsheba's husband to try to cover it up, and then he lied about it. And it took the prophet Nathan showing him his own sin by telling him a story to let him see how far he had gone. Just hold your place in 1 Thessalonians and go with me to Psalm chapter 51 back in the Old Testament. Or you can just listen to it as I read it. Here's what David, here's what David said after his sin with Bathsheba with his repentance. Notice how David realized what sexual immorality had done to him. He said, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Sexual immorality dirties us up. He says, For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. And get this, he said, Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what's evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words, and blameless in your judgment. You see, sexual immorality affects you, it affects everybody around you, but let me remind you more than anything, it affects God. He said, against you and you only have I sinned. Every time you click on that button to look at the internet, you're sinning against God. Every time you have a thought about, I don't want him to be my husband, I'd rather have him. That's a, that's, that, that's a sin against God. And verse 5 says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in my sin my mother conceived me. Behold, your delight and truth in the inward being. And you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. And he realized his dirtiness, and he said, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. There's something about sexual immorality that just drains every bit of life out of you. And David realized that he had no joy, he had no gladness, and he wanted it back. He said, hide your face from my sins. Blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. And get this. And then he said in verse 13, he said, and then... I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. You see, when you're living in sexual immorality, you become ineffective for the kingdom. And David realized he had become ineffective. He couldn't make a difference in all the world for God's kingdom. 
And he said, cleanse me, God, change me, and then I will teach transgressors your way. I really believe in my heart. I don't know if it's the biggest thing, but I, I think it probably has to be. Other than, other than maybe some people sitting in churches today and assuming salvation and thinking they're saved and they don't really understand what it means to have a relationship with Christ, I would say other than that, that sexual immorality is crippling the church today more than anything. It's rendering the church ineffective. It caused Solomon, David's son. The Bible says he, was the most, he asked for wisdom, most wise man to ever live. Remember, we talked about Solomon several weeks back when we were in another series, and Solomon threw it all away, all the wisdom, because of sexual immorality. 300 wives and 700 concubines. That's craziness. Threw it all away. You see, there's just something different about sexual sin. The Bible says the sin affects the body. For believers, remember, as New Testament, New Covenant believers, our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And there's just something about sexual sin that jacks that all up. Every sin is bad. Every sin corrupts. Saying a little white lie, like I said, will send you to hell just as equally as murdering someone. However, sexual immorality goes deeper. Sexual immorality cuts to the core of humans in a way that other sins do not. And the reason is simple because it's intertwined with the heart and the soul and the mind as well as with the body. And not every sin is like that. That's what Paul means. Turn with me again to 1 Corinthians, and then we're going to finally get to Thessalonians. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18. That's what Paul meant when he said that every other sins outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, and a little bit further. Aaron shared part of this as we were singing worship songs this morning. It says in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 18, it says, flee from sexual immorality. This is the same Paul that wrote Thessalonians. He's talking here to the church at Corinth. It says, flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? Aaron said this as we were worshiping. Listen, here it is in Scripture. You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. That's what he said. No way around it. Paul might say today, if he was standing here, I don't know, he might say, you're practically going to ruin your life here on earth, not just in eternity, if you don't get it straight with sexual immorality. And this covers every person in this room, I believe, in some way, some form, some fashion. Maybe some are deeper in right now, and you don't see a way out, and it's affecting your life more than anybody, and it's affecting your marriage, and you know it's going to affect more than that if you don't get a grip on it. Maybe some of you have walked through it in the past, and maybe it's in different forms and fashions, whatever it may be, an affair or a thought life or pornography or whatever it may be. It, it covers a full gamut. But I'll tell you this, if we don't get check on it, it can tear apart lives. It can tear apart relationships in a way that other sins do not. It doesn't excuse other sins. It doesn't mean that obscene pride or lying or outrageous lifestyle of some sort wouldn't ruin a life either. That's not what I'm saying. They will. But a plain reading of Scripture this morning reveals this truth, especially about sexual immorality. So let's see what Paul had to say to the church at Thessalonica. Chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. He said, Finally, then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you received from us how you ought to live and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. That's what he said, your sanctification. You're set apart, you're different now. Sanctification is your growth in Christ. And he's saying, this is God's will for you. This is what we desire, to see you growing in your faith. You're different now. He said that you, here's what he said. First thing he mentions, that you abstain from sexual immorality. Verse 4 says that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor. 
not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. In other words, Paul says, when you don't do that, you're acting like someone who does not know Jesus Christ at all. And he said in verse 6, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter because the Lord's an avenger in all these things as we told you beforehand and solemnly warmed you. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. And then the last verse for today, it says, Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God. You get that? That's pretty deep. Whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but you're just saying, God, I don't care what you have to say. Who gives his Holy Spirit to you? A lot of stuff to unpack in that, so let's do it. There are not many things. I'll say this first of all. I've given you a place to take your notes on newsletter if you want to, or maybe in your Bible, whatever. But there's not many things from which the Bible actually tells us to abstain. Do you know that? We throw that out there a lot of times. The word itself is actually only used seven times in the New Testament. And the word abstain means to completely do without. That's what it means in the Greek. It means literally abstain. It means to do without. Whenever we see the word abstain in the Bible... We know two things for certain. I promise you this. When you see that word abstain in the New Testament, it means these two things. Number one, it's a command of God. It is God's command. In other words, it's not an option or a good idea. Paul was not saying, hey, it might be a good idea if you feel like it to, to abstain from sexual immorality. That's not what he said. He, said, he didn't give a list of, of things and say, A, B, C, or D, choose one. It, it might be a good option for you to abstain from sexual immorality, you know, sometimes, maybe, whatever, check mark. That's not what he said. He said abstain. It's a command of God. The second thing is an absolute prohibition. It means do not do it. That's what he said. So, whenever we find a command to abstain in the Bible, we ought to take it seriously. I'm just, part of me is just a good old country boy, and if God says abstain, that's what God said. We, we, we have to come... To one happened to come this morning to one such command in our text. That's, this is one of the places where God says, abstain. God commands believers to abstain from sexual immorality. God didn't say that believers are to abstain from sex. That's not what he said. God created sex within a marriage context. God created as a gift between a husband and a wife. That's not what he said. He didn't say sex was a bad thing. God created sex. God didn't say that. But he said, abstain from sexual immorality. Period, end of story, no gray area. The commandment itself is crystal clear. Now, let me just say, as with many other hard things to deal with in life, that this, I realize, is not a doctrine which is popular in our society. And it's not a doctrine that's very popular for people to preach about in a lot of churches. And it's not fun for me to stand up here and preach about it, just to be honest with you. But it's necessary and it's right. See, our, our greatest danger this morning, I believe, is to simply look at this and say, this doesn't apply to me, because that guy over there, that lady over there is much worse off than me, because I know what they're doing. But I'm telling you, it applies to everyone, especially in the things that are more hidden, pornography, etc. We convince ourselves that it's not hurting anybody, but listen, that's somebody's daughter, that's somebody's son. Did you know that Atlanta, Georgia is the sex slave capital of the United States? We're less than three hours away from it. Either we think we've heard all this before, or we'd rather not hear it, or perhaps we think these words are meant for someone else, but they're meant for all of us. They're meant for you, and they're meant for me. I, I believe no message is needed more, like I said, other than the message of salvation in today's church for believers to hear than this about sexual sin. I read you a quote last week. It said, Christians, some of you will remember this if you were listening last week. It says, Christians in the United States are in greater danger of being seduced by non-Christian cultural values than we are of being persecuted by them. In other words, we're more apt to be changed by the culture right now than we are to make a difference in it. Listen to this quote. Another one for you today. There's little difference in ethical behavior between those who go to church and those who don't. And I, that's, I'm not saying that for everybody, but I think, I think a general look at the church would probably say, yeah, that's about right. You see, Christians struggle in the same issues as everyone else, and we're letting sexual immorality run wild in our lives and in our churches. 
We're losing our influence in the culture around us because we're not being any different than someone who's lost, as Paul said. And the problem is, is that we know better. And we're saved from that. And we don't have to do that anymore. I read another quote that says that there are two things we've almost completely lost today, and it's the word virgin and the ability to blush. Listen, I've been in the ministry for 20 years. My first job in the ministry was at Shades Mountain Baptist Church in Vestavia, Homewood area. And in 20 years, I have talked to people numerous times people struggling in the areas of sexual immorality. You know, and then I realized my own weaknesses and my own failures. And, and, you, and, you, and you think, man, you're having to talk with people and they're dealing with this. And as I look at it, I can honestly look back. I really tried to think. As many times as I've talked with people about things that they're struggling with sexually, whether it be homosexuality, adultery, someone who... Has, uh, had an abortion, divorce that was, that was not a biblical divorce, pornography, lust of all kinds, thought lives, all that kind of thing. Almost every time it was a church member. Almost every time. Let's face the facts. When it comes to sexual immorality, it plagues today's church. Fact. Hardcore pornography has come out of the closet and it's out in the wide open in our society. Fact, through the internet, the vilest forms of pornography are now available to anyone and everyone. With no, if, if no guards are taken, children, right there. They can pull it up. Phones, internet. Just a reminder, just a reminder, you better be checking those phones and that internet, parents. Homosexuality is now seen as an acceptable alternative lifestyle in our culture. Fact, most mainline denominations now have openly gay clergy. Fact, we routinely see things on television that shocked people 25 years ago. Do you know the controversy it stirred? This was much longer than 25 years ago when Gone with the Wind came out and he said, frankly, my dear, I don't give a... I mean, the world turned upside down. And now you turn on the TV and stuff that you would have had to buy HBO to get late at night, at 12.30 at night, just comes on ABC and CBS. I mean, nothing much surprises us anymore. We've seen it all. And we've, here's the problem, I think. We've lost our ability to be shocked. Adultery, premarital sex, group sex, lesbianism, wife swapping, pornography in our local stores, X-rated movies on TV, easy divorce, oh, I just found someone I like better, multiple marriages, quick abortions, incest, child abuse, bestiality, teen pregnancy, gay churches, child molesters, sexually transmitted disease, sex education and protection rather than abstinence, and it's just the beginning of the list. And we justify it. It's just a picture. It's just an Internet site. We take the reality of it and we act like God is not looking. And on and on the list goes. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Let's break it down here for just a minute. I tried to make this simple and straightforward. Verses 1 through 3. I want you to see, and I'm not great at English. I was a history major. I can't even speak my own language very well. A word and a phrase or a word here and a couple of words there that I think we really need to pull together. And we see it in verses 1 through 3. Let's read it again. Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to live and to please God just as you're doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. We need to put that word abstain and we need to put that phrase or those two words, not really a phrase, sexual immorality together. Abstain from sexual immorality. We need to bring that together. There, those are two words, phrases that we need to pull all together. So abstain, I mentioned it earlier, it means to do without completely. 
A deeper understanding of the word abstain means to hold off from something, to distance oneself from something. In other words, to have nothing to do with it. That's literally what it means in the scripture. You're, you're abstaining yourself from something when you completely separate yourself from it. And the second phrase, sexual immorality, it comes from the Greek word pornea, P-O-R-N-E-I-A. That's where we get our usage of those two words, sexual immorality. That was the Greek word. It's a very broad word. It, it encompasses every kind of sexual activity outside the circle of God's will. It covers the sins of the mind and the body and the ears and the eyes and the lips. It includes premarital sex, extramarital sex, every form of homosexuality, adultery, every form of pornography. In fact, in the, the English word pornography comes from that Greek word pornea. Paul is telling us that Christians must abstain from that kind of lifestyle in the broadest sense of the word. No excuses. This means there can be no moderate immorality, I guess is what I'm saying. And he uses that, uh, there can't be, I guess, social adultery, no victimless pornography. We're, we're not to dabble in sexual sin. We're to have nothing to do with it. Sex is for marriage, and marriage is for one man and one woman. In a world of impurity, Christians have to be different. We have to set the standard. That's what the word sanctification is really all about. It's being distinctively different, set apart for God. If you're a believer, you're set apart for God. You are to be different. You're bought with a price. You're not your own anymore. You are made to live for God. I mean, and, and it was like that in Paul's day. I mean, think about what it, it, was, it was like. I mean, Thessalonica... It, it, you know, you, we think Bible stuff and we think, well, everything in the Bible was all good and great, but it wasn't. Thessalonica was a seaport. It meant people from all over the Mediterranean world stopped there and transit from one place to another. So you had sailors and visiting merchants and they brought with them sexual promiscuity. It was all over that society where Paul was. The Greek religions of that day, like I said, they practiced sacred prostitution. They made it a part of their religious worship. And here comes Paul with this gospel of Jesus Christ and he flips that world upside down. He said, that's not what God created you for. The famed orator Demosthenes, he described the moral climate of ancient Greece this way. He said, we keep prostitutes for pleasure. We keep mistresses from day to day for the needs of the body. We keep wives for the begetting of children and for faithful guarding of the home. That's the society they lived in. I mean, so there was enormous pressure upon the church at Thessalonica, I'm sure, as they were these new believers in Christ to go back to the cultural way. And Paul was saying, don't do it. It's not worth it. You've been bought with a price. You're different now. You're saved. You're redeemed. You're a child of God now. You don't have to do this. Second thing, verses 4 through 6. We see two commands that we must obey. Paul goes on and he, he says in verses 4 and 5, and I want you to see the first, the first command, and this is it. It's, Paul says, control your own body. See it in verses 4 and 5. He says that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. Verse 4, literally, if you look at it in the Greek, it literally commanded each person to possess his own vessel. It's literally what it meant. To possess your own, your, your body is your vessel. To possess your own vessel is to control it in the sense of mastering the inner impulse to sin. When God is not in control, then the body controls the man. But when God's in control, you can be different. And notice verse 5, he mentions that when believers delve into sexual sin, that we're just like those who do not know God. And I tell you this, when people turn away from God, anything is possible. There's no limit, there's no end, there, there are no depths to the shame and the pollution and the cesspools of life that people who claim to know God will live in for years and years and years and become useless for the kingdom of God. But if we know Christ and we know Him well, it can be different. It has to be different. The second command in that is in the first part of verse 6. And that's, it just simply is this, don't cheat other people with your sexual sin. Here's what Paul said. He said that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter. 
with your sexual sin. Paul says don't take advantage of other people because of your sexual sin. The King James Version used the word defraud. Don't defraud other people with your sexual sin. Other translations use the word cheat. You know, don't, don't cheat your friend by sleeping with his wife. Don't cheat your wife by dreaming of other women. Don't cheat your husband by dreaming of other men. Don't cheat your boyfriend or girlfriend by engaging in sex with them because that may be somebody else's husband or somebody else's wife one day. And you can't ever get that back. When you give away your purity, you've given it away. doesn't mean God can't ever use you again. It doesn't mean God can't forgive you, but you've given it away. Don't cheat your friends by claiming to be one thing in public and by being another in private. Don't cheat your family by sneaking away behind their backs and living a different life than they think you're living. Don't cheat anybody that loves you by doing something that you know they would be ashamed of if they knew about it. You see, sexual, immor sexual immorality is like that. It always cheats somebody else. Usually it's someone you love very much. Just ask any wife whose husband left. Just ask any parent whose child had an affair. Just ask church members who've seen leaders in their churches fall to sexual sin. It always affects someone else. And perhaps the saddest thing about it and we all know it because we've struggled in it somehow, some way. It never satisfies, does it? Lust, sexual immorality, sexual sin, it's like craving salt when you're dying of thirst, isn't it? That's what it's like. It promises everything, it delivers nothing. There's no great release like we think there'll be. There's no lasting satisfaction. You always have to go back for more, you think. The law of diminishing returns, lust forces you to keep coming back until you realize that Jesus is stronger than that. You don't have to. Third thing, I want you to see three facts about sexual immorality that we need to know. We need to walk away with these things. Last part of verse 6, and then verses 7 and 8. The first one, last part of verse 6. Know this for a fact. God will punish those who practice immorality. That's what it says. Last part of verse 6. It says, the Lord's an avenger in all these things as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. Sometimes he punishes the body because of sexual immorality, sexual disease, whatever it may be. Sometimes he punishes the mind. Sometimes our speech, our eyes, our health, almost always our memories. Sexual immorality produces that inward deadening that's both unexpected and inevitable. In my opinion, and this is just my opinion, I think the most likely judgment that God brings upon sexual immorality for the believer happens this side of heaven. And if I've seen it once, I've seen it a million times. It's that God will simply leave us alone to suffer the consequences, the natural consequences of our sin. I know this. In the future, what has been done in secret will be shouted from the rooftops. You won't hide it forever. It will end up bringing major consequences. Sexual sin just has a different effect. Mark it down as a fact. And I encourage you, if you're playing around with it, quit playing with fire. It will burn you. You can live in better things. God has better things for you. Verse 7. Fact. Fact. God has called us to purity. For God has not called us for impurity, says verse 7, but in holiness. That's all i got to say about that. Matthew 5, 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. God's called us to purity. You want to see God work at work in your life? Be just like King David. You won't see it until you get pure. Seek Him. Seek purity. Verse 8. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man but God, who gives us his Holy Spirit, gives his Holy Spirit to you. Last command there. Rejecting purity means rejecting God. Rejecting purity means rejecting God. To reject means to treat with utter contempt. It's to, re re it's to render the commandment of God null and void. That's what Nathan meant when he asked David in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 9. He said, why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what's evil in his sight? See, we're ignoring God. 
I mean, all of us need to hear this message. How many times have we ignored God with this? I need it personally. You need it personally. No one's exempt. Not the pastor, not the deacons, not the staff members, not every man, woman, boy, and girl in this room. And if we think the temptations for sexual immorality are going to go away, then we're, we're living on a planet by ourselves, and we are loony, and we have lost our minds, because it's only going to get worse. Real quick, just write these down, memorize them something. Let me just give you some practical guidelines. These are biblical concepts just in dealing with sexual immorality, the temptations. How do you head it off at the temptation level and not delve into the sin again and again and again? And, oh, Lord, forgive me, I'm not going to do that again. And then three weeks later, there you are again. Ever been there? <clears throat> One, know your limits. I'm going to go through these quick. Know your limits. Know your limits. Don't put yourself in situations that you don't need to be in. Number two, stay out of questionable areas. There's just places that as believers we just don't need to go. Stay out of questionable areas. Three, don't fight the battle alone. Get an accountability partner. Find somebody. Don't act like it's not happening. Find somebody you can trust and talk to. Get them to hold you accountable. Get them to call you. You can set up stuff on your internet that if you ever try to look at something bad, man, it'll ding and whistle and bell and it'll, it'll make, you know, it's where you won't do it. Four, don't make excuses. Don't make excuses. Well, it's just, it's just kind of who I've become. It's who I am and, and, you know, God knows that and God will overlook that. No, he won't. Don't make excuses. Five, be honest about your problem. Be honest about it. Six, trace the cycle of lust in your life. In other words, don't go back down dead-end roads. Been there, done that. Didn't work the first time. Why am I going to do it the second time, and the third time, and the fourth time? And number seven, the most important one, remember, if you're a believer, remember who you are. If you're not a believer, then th this is kind of null and void. You can't ever do this if you're not a believer your biggest problem is that you need to get saved and you need to be saved today and you need to know Christ and the redemption that comes from Christ. But if you are a believer, then remember who you are in Christ and act like one. You're a child of God. You're a totally new creation. You're saved. You're redeemed. You're justified. You're forgiven. You're regenerated. You're seated in Christ in heavenly places. All the promises of God now belong to you if you're a believer. You bear the name of your heavenly Father. You're a child of God. And you're called to live to His glory. You're not made to live in sexual sin, and neither am I. And we can do that because remember, verse 8 said at the very end that God gives us His Holy Spirit. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to jump up and down and do crazy things to get the Holy Spirit. If you're a redeemed believer of Christ, the Holy Spirit's in you. And you have the ability to walk away from this stuff and choose Christ. You're not alone in this battle. Your weakness is His strength. I promise that. The guys are going to come and lead us in some closing uh, songs. And as we do that, let me read two verses to you as they come up. Romans 6, 6 says, Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. And then Romans 6.18 says, Before we were saved, we were slaves to sin. Now we are slaves of righteousness. You do not have to be imprisoned by sexual sin. You can become a slave of righteousness to Christ. Let me pray over us, okay? Father, we come before you this morning. Lord, and as we close out uh, this message in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 1 through 8, Lord, where it is all about sexual immorality and how to deal with that. Father, I pray that this word would break us at the core, break us, um, break us down, Father, that we would come to the foot of the cross, Lord, and that we would realize that none of us are immune. Father, that... Um, we have things to repent of. Lord, we have things that we need to be honest about. And Lord, that we 
can give this to you, and Lord, you can change it for us. So I pray for believers in this room, Lord, who are struggling in sexual immorality. It's rendering them ineffective. Lord, they're, they're not the moms and the dads, the husbands and wives, the kids that they need to be because of this. Lord, bring healing and change. Bring restoration. Lord, I'm praying over some marriages that are broken by this, Lord, that you would help us take a step back and realize the grace that you have shown us and that it would drive us to a point of repentance and change, Father, and that out of our thankfulness for what you've done for us, Lord, that it would give us the desire to walk with you and serve you instead of being mastered by these things. So, Lord, I pray for healing in marriages. Lord, I pray... Lord, that we can just be honest and truthful about it. And God, that you would fix things that we cannot fix on our own. Maybe there's some folks in here and they have tried to fix it. They don't want to be in these places, but they've been trying to fix it. And maybe not realizing that you're the one that can fix it. You're the one that can change it. Lord, that you can set some people free today. There are some people in here who never, ever, ever, ever again have to look at pornography. They don't have to do it anymore. Maybe yesterday was the last day. And Lord, there are some people in here and they're having an affair right now. Lord, they're, they're cheating on their husband and wife and they're hiding it. And it's got to be done. It's got to change. There's got to be healing and change. And you can do that. God, maybe throughout this room are thought lives that are riddled with sexual immorality. We, didn't, we don't wake up in the morning setting out to do it. But Lord, something catches an eye or maybe there's a problem in a marriage and we, we wish we were in a different place or whatever it may be. God, you can fix those things. So we give them to you, Lord. And I pray for the non-believer in this room and maybe they hear all this and say, yeah, I want to I be pure. I want to be different. I see that. I see what you're talking about. But the reality is, is the biggest problem in their life is they don't know you. They do not have a relationship with you. They're not even sure about their eternity, much less their sexual morality. Lord, would you set them free today that they might be saved and changed for eternity? Then they can work on stuff like this. Father, we're just going to give you a few minutes here as we close. Lord, just do what you need to do in our lives, Lord, that people would be praying and that lives would be changed, God. It's your anointed time. You, you knew it before we ever came here today, what we'd be talking about and what people would need. So, Lord, just take over. Do what you need to do, Lord. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand and sing with these guys, and let's just uh, let God be at work, okay?